Welcome back. Pharmacology, everything you always wanted to know but were afraid to ask. So this lecture is going to cover a few chapters. I'm going to start with chapter 13. And chapter 13 is about salicylates and acetaminophen. And I love saying salicylate because aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. Say that three times fast. It's a salicylate. And acetaminophen, good old-fashioned Tylenol. So we start off talking about pain, and I know that every one of you has had a lecture on pain, either from myself or another instructor, or somewhere along the line you've known someone with pain. Here's what I want to tell you. Pain is whatever your patient says it is. So don't, you know, let the old myths kind of disturb you and make you be judgmental. Remember, we're nurses, and the nursing ethical principle of justice, everyone gets treated the same. Take your patient at their word. If they say their pain is a 10, it's a 10, okay? Um, so we're going to start with salicylates, which is just good old-fashioned aspirin. And here's how old I am. When I was a kid, that's all we had. There was no Tylenol. So if you had a fever, St. Joseph's aspirin for children. They were flavored, a terrible orange taste. They were gross. Anyway, I digress. So what is salicylic um, acid or salicylates? Uh, they are actually used for pain, so they're analgesics. Uh, they decrease inflammation, which acetaminophen does not do. Um, and they're used to decrease fever, pyrexia. Um, they're also used for other reasons because they have a quality that is antiplatelet aggregating. What does that mean? That means that aspirin, especially you'll see pe people on a low dose aspirin, 81 milligrams a day maybe, it's called a baby aspirin. So it's being used to prevent a heart attack or a stroke because it prevents thrombocytes or platelets from clumping together and causing a clot. And that's why it's used prophylactically in those you know uses where it's not used for pain. It's not used as an analgesic. Um, so. Other things that you need to know about aspirin, um, we talked about use for fever. We talked about the fact that aspirin is an anti-inflammatory, so it's great for arthritic pain because osteoarthritis stems from wear and tear on the joints, and that wear and tear on the joints causes inflammation in the joints. Aspirin can actually help with that. Uh, when we talk about side effects, because like I said before, every pill has a side effect, the big thing with aspirin, gastric upset, GI reactions, and GI bleeds. This is important to know. Aspirin, when used on a regular basis, can actually cause damage to the lining of the stomach or even you know, parts of the small intestine, which can cause the patient will have dark, tarry stool. That's called melana, and that is a telltale sign of a GI bleed. Um, if they're allergic to aspirin, of course, they shouldn't have it. And hives, rash, those kinds of things, you would know. And if the patient has an issue with blood loss, if the patient's been in an accident, the very last thing that you want to do is give them something that's going to prevent their blood from clotting quickly enough. So aspirin would be contraindicated in that circumstance. Um, there's something else that you really need to know, and I'm looking at slide seven. So contraindications, of course, known hypersensitivity reactions and bleeding disorders. Don't give them aspirin. But there's something called Rye syndrome. So a child with any kind of a viral infection, like the flu, influenza, that's a virus, um, chicken pox, varicella, also a virus, should never, never, never under any circumstances be given aspirin because there is a relationship between the use of aspirin in children with viral infections and the development of Rye syndrome. And I even included a little blip in there. Rye syndrome, it's um, a form of an acute encephalopathy. So there is change in the cognitive function of the brain and then fatty infiltration of the liver. So the, the liver tends to kind of like get overgrown um, and it can, it can lead up to death. It can be fatal. So no aspirin in children with viral infections? That's an NCLEX question. You're welcome. And then, of course, who would you use cautiously? Um, you would, of course, use cautiously in anybody with any hepatic or renal diseases, pregnancy, lactation, anybody who has any type 
of a coagulopathy or a bleeding or clotting problem. Anybody with ulcers, peptic ulcers, gastric ulcers, and people with mild diabetes or gout, also it would be contraindicated. They should stay away from aspirin. A safe bet for most of those situations, good old acetaminophen, Tylenol. And that's what we're going to next. non salicylates well, that's acetaminophen. Acetaminophen is not anti-inflammatory. It doesn't have any anti-inflammatory action. It will, however, lower your fever. So it's antipyretic and it does address pain issues. So it's an analgesic. Um, when we talk about acetaminophen, it can be used pretty much with almost every patient. So if you have a patient that's on an anticoagulant, if they have an allergy to aspirin, if they have an underlying coagulopathy or a bleeding disorder, like say hemophilia, um, anyone who's had any recent surgical procedures or has an upcoming surgical procedure because of aspirin's effect on the blood clotting, acetaminophen is the way to go. A uh, couple other things you need to know about uh, acetaminophen, and this one I put in all capital letters. This is slide 11. Number one adverse reaction, hepatotoxicity. Acetaminophen, if not used as directed or overused, will cause liver failure. You cannot live without your liver. Hepatotoxicity, jaundice, hepatic failure. They're the big ones that you want to remember. Those are board questions. So anybody that's got any liver damage, liver disease, cirrhosis, any of the hepatitis is, 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 right? Those patients and people, by the way, that drink on a regular basis, alcohol, because alcohol is metabolized through the liver, puts a strain on the liver. They can have acetaminophen. If someone should overdose on acetaminophen, the antidote is N-acetylcysteine, also known as acetylcysteine, and it's got the trade name Mucomist. And remember this, the maximum dosage of acetaminophen for an average adult in a 24-hour period is 3 grams or 3,000 milligrams. It used to be 4. If you've seen 4 grams or 4,000 milligrams written anywhere or anyone's told you that, no, 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 no. 3 grams, 3,000 milligrams maximum dosage in a 24-hour period. Don't forget it. Uh, slide 12 talks about the things I've already talked about and I highlighted in yellow. Chronic alcohol use, liver disease. They cannot have acetaminophen, period, end of story. You don't want to make their problems any worse than they already are. And then the next few slides talk about the nursing process, you know, evaluating the patient's pain. When you give someone something, say, to manage pain, have them quantify their pain, zero to ten. Zero is no pain, 10 is excruciating. Put a number on it. And then when you give them the medication, go back and reassess if it's an oral med a half hour, 45 minutes later. And what is their pain now? If it was a 10 and now it's a 6, well, it worked. That's all you have to write when you're documenting. Patient's pain, 10 out of 10, you know, 7 p.m. Administered 650 milligrams of acetaminophen. 7.30. Patient states pain, 6 out of 10. So I got it right. And I can read, it was a 10 a half hour ago, and now it's a 6. The med work, and that's all you have to write. Purely the facts, okay? Objective information and nothing more. Um, one more thing I want to talk about, and this is in regard to aspirin, salicylates. Uh, salicylate toxicity, or salicylate really poisoning, uh, is called salicylism. Again, say all these words three times fast. The signs of salicylism are vomiting, tinnitus, which is that ringing or buzzing in the ear, a sudden change in mentation, like an onset of confusion, high fever, respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis. And then they'll go into multiple organ failure. And you know what comes next? Death. So salicylism is absolutely um, a life-threatening disease. Make sure you know the signs and symptoms of it. Acetaminophen, you can give it with meals. You can give it on an empty stomach. If a patient is overdosing on acetaminophen, usually they'll have signs initially like nausea, vomiting. They'll start to sweat and generalized malaise. There's that antidote written again. And the next few pages go through the nursing process. Make sure you remember 
uh, and I'm looking at slide 24. Patients having any surgical procedure or dental work or anything where there's a risk for bleeding, they must stop the aspirin usually one week before the procedure. Some surgeons will say even two weeks, depending on what's happening. But one week would be the minimum. And remember, acetaminophen is not an anti-inflammatory. So if you get a question that says you're the nurse caring for a patient and complaints of osteoarthritis, you know, mild or moderate pain, which of the following medications would the nurse choose to administer? Wouldn't be acetaminophen, might be an NSAID, which we're going to get to next. So just remember that acetaminophen is not anti-inflammatory. Aspirin is, NSAIDs are. All right. And that's going to do it for this chapter. You can go through and read the, the Q&As at the end of the chapter. And I'm going to move on to chapter 14. Tell me you're not having a good time. Okay.